In this video, I'm going to discuss what's called a liquid-liquid extraction, and this will be using what are called separatory funnels. So we use two different solvents here that separate based on differences in polarity or solubility. So a solution with two or more solutes is placed into a separatory funnel, and those look like this right here, so it has kind of this round conical shape and we can have two different solvents in here that separate into two different phases. So a second solvent is added to the separatory funnel. The separatory funnel is shaken which mixes the two solvents and then the separatory funnel is allowed to settle. The two solvents separate, they it'll look kind of like this, and so the higher density will be the one to go to the bottom. So this is a higher density solvent than that and the two solvents separate into layers. So the two solutes, rather, separate into the layers in which they are more soluble. So this should say solutes right here. And so these are my images that I made here. So we have, say, this is water in here, and it has two different solutes. One are the black dots, the other are those more brownish dots. So we put that in there, then we add in the organic layer and shake it, and then allow it to settle. And so, say, these brownish dots are the less polar ones, so the more hydrophobic solutes, and then these black ones are the more hydrophilic solutes. And so those will mostly go into the water, and the hydrophobic ones will mostly go into the organic layer. And so then we can open this up by opening this and take the water out, and so that will then have removed the black dots there, the more hydrophilic ones. And so we are left with just the hydrophobic, the organic compounds here. And you could do this again. You can do this multiple times. They're called washes. All right. And so this is using the partition coefficient, which I've already talked about in several other videos. So just to quickly go through it here. So if we have a solute A in solvent 1 and it's shaken with solvent 2, then the solute distributes between the two liquid phases such that we end up with the C1 here in the solvent 1 and C2 here in the solvent 2. And then this is our partition coefficient here, which is just the ratio of those two concentrations. And so that's going to determine which of the solvents the solute ends up going into. So here is an example. And so in this example, we're going to be looking at two different ways of actually doing this extraction. So if we have, we have an extraction process, say we have a partition coefficient that is 10, and we have five grams of an organic solute dissolved in our 100 milliliters of water, which will be our solvent one. So the two ways we could do this extraction, we could either do three extractions with 50 milliliters of ether, or we could do a single one with 150 milliliters of ether. And so what we'll see is that doing the three with the smaller volume is actually going to be better than doing a single one with the larger volume. So in the first case, we have this, so our K is equal to 10, which is equal to the ratio here of our solute. And so when we plug those in, we get this. We do some algebraic manipulation, so we get 500X equals 500 minus 100X, which is just 600X equals 500, so our X equals 0.83 grams. And so that is how much is left in the solvent after we do the extraction. So we end up recovering 4.17 grams from the extraction. So after two more of those, so we do that again and again two more times, and so we end up getting 4.98 grams out of our 5 grams of solute there. In the second case, if we do the extraction just once, but with 150 milliliters rather than the 50, what we see is we end up getting just 4.69 grams of our solute extracted. And so that means we compare this to the 4.98 grams done in the three smaller extractions, we can see that doing one large extraction is less efficient, and it's less efficient by this amount. So we are losing this much by doing just the one large extraction rather than three smaller ones, which is about 5.8% of our solute that will be remaining in the water solvent. 
So we're trying to extract it from the water and we'll end up with some left over. And if we do three smaller extractions, we will get more of it out than if we do one large extraction. All right, so the phases here, so remember we're looking at the organic phase and the, the water or aqueous phase. And so many common organic solvents are less dense than water, but not all of them. And so having high concentrations of dissolved ions, such as sulfuric acid or sodium chloride, can increase the density of water. As such, there must be a way to determine which of the two solvents is in the phase on top. So we want to know what's on the top layer and what's on the bottom layer. A lot of these solvents are just clear, so just looking at them you can't really tell. So we want to try testing to see which one is which. So what we can do is just try adding drops of water. If the top layer is aqueous, the drops will just dissolve into it. If the top layer is organic, the drops will form droplets on top. And so that will tell you that the top layer is organic, or if it dissolves into it, that would tell you that the top layer is aqueous. And so these are just some densities of common solvents that are used. So I put pure water here in blue. I put things that are more dense than that in red, and things that are less dense than that in green. And so we can see that saturated water with NaCl is more dense, and saturated water with H2SO4 is even more dense yet. But then we see a lot of these common organic solvents here are less dense than water, but some of them are more dense. So DMSO, we have our methyl chlorides here, and so those are all more dense than water. And so that's why you would want to do that test, because all of these are just clear liquids, and so just by looking at them, you wouldn't be able to tell whether or not they are aqueous or organic. So another thing that we need to think about are drying agents, because even if your organic solvent is immiscible in water, after shaking it, some water will remain either as tiny droplets or small amounts of dissolved in your organic layer. So the organic layer then is then known as wet. And the more miscible water is in your organic solvent, the wetter it will be after shaking. So for instance, at room temperature, diethyl ether, which is a very common organic solvent, dissolves 1.5% mass of water, and water dissolves 7.5% mass of ether. So they are slightly soluble in each other, and so that's why you would want to do this drying process on your organic solvent after you do an extraction. So ether does dissolve much less if the water is NaCl saturated. So we therefore need what's called an anhydrous drying agent, usually an inorganic salt to pull the water out of the organic layer. So these are some common or, uh, inorganic salts right here. And so we have our anhydrous MgSO4. We put that into our wet solution, and this will form this hydrate with the water and pull that out of solution because this will remain a solid in there. And so it's just easy to filter that out afterwards. Another thing we have to worry about are what are called emulsions. So these are colloidal suspensions of one liquid in another. So minute droplets of an organic solvent are often held in suspension in an aqueous solution when the two are mixed or shaken vigorously. So emulsions may require a long time to separate into two layers and can be a nuisance. There are a few techniques that can be helpful to break these difficult emulsions. So again, just letting it set can break it on its own. Uh, this can be helped by gently stirring with a stirring rod. So if one of the solvents is water, like it often is, then adding saturated NaCl water can help destroy the emulsion. So the water in the organic layer migrates into the concentrated salt solution through osmosis. In some instances, maybe a centrifuge can be used or gravity filtration could be used to try and remove those emulsions. So something else you'll use a lot when doing extractions are these rotary evaporators. So they are a 
motor-driven device that can rapidly evaporate solvent using heating, usually in a water bath, and reduced pressure. So they will look like this. We have our water bath here, and we have this motor that can reduce the pressure inside of it. So this avoids what's called bumping, which is the creation of large bubbles that can cause loss of material and can even cause fires or break the glassware. And so the rotation, so this is going to be rotating around this way. And that spreads a thin film of the solution over the inner surface of the round bottom flask, which accelerates the evaporation. And so that's something that you often do during these extractions, is you do a rotary evaporation to get rid of some of the solvent. And so the other thing to think about here are our separation schemes. So you always want to have a good separation scheme before you do a separation so that you actually know what you're doing and what's going to end up where. And so what you often see when doing these separation schemes are these things right here. So we have some kind of alcohol or phenol. We have an amine, a carboxylic acid, and a ketone. And so what we do is we have these in an ether layer because these are all soluble in diethyl ether or some other kind of organic solvent. And so what we'll do is add this weak base here. And so this weak base isn't going to be strong enough to deprotonate like this alcohol right here, this phenol. And so everything will stay in the ether layer, but it will deprotonate this carboxylic acid. And so that will go into the water layer. And so then we can separate those. And now we have gotten rid of the carboxylic acid. So we are just left with these three things. Now we can use a stronger base, which will deprotonate this. And so that will go into the water layer while the amine and the ketone stay in the ether layer. So we end up with just those in our organic solvent. Now we can add HCl, which will protonate our amine here. And so that will become charged and go into the water layer while the ketone here stays in the ether layer. And so we have now separated all four of those things from each other using this separation. And so having a separation scheme like this, as I said, is necessary because you want to know at each step what molecules are going where. And so you don't end up dumping out the thing that you're actually trying to get. And so a little bit more of a concrete example of this I mean, it's essentially the same thing, but like I said, a little more concrete. So we can have benzoic acid here. We have a phenol here, the benzoic acid, which is a pKa of 4.2, the phenol pKa of 10. We have the hexylamine, which is a pKb of 3.35. And then we have a 3-hexanone, which is a pKa of 19 on that, that alpha carbon. Uh, I also put cyclohexane here so separating that out would be something a little bit more difficult to do but I'm just putting it there just so we can sort of follow things along so again we're putting in the bicarbonate that's a weak base so as a pKb of 7.6 so that's only going to deprotonate this which has a pKa of 4.2 but not this because it has a pKa of 10. And so that becomes charged. And now it is, in fact, water soluble. Where up here, we see that the water solubility is only 0 0.003 grams per milliliter. So then we can remove our aqueous layer. And this will come out in the aqueous layer as well as this bicarbonate right here. Or, well, now it's carbonic acid in this form. But the bicarbonate that we added here, which has now been protonated. So then we want to go down here. So this is now in our ether layer. We just have these four species left. We now add this hydroxide, which has a pKb of 0.2. So that's going to be able to deprotonate this phenol here, but it won't do anything to any of the other species in there. So now this goes from being water soluble 0.08 grams per milliliter to being completely water soluble because now this has this charge on it. And so we can remove that with the aqueous layer here. 
And so now we end up with just these three species left. We add our HCl, which is a pKa of negative 6.3, that will protonate this, but not either of these two things here. So then this becomes charged, and now it is completely soluble in water, where up here it was only about 0 0.012 grams per milliliter soluble in water. So we can remove that in the aqueous layer. And so now we end up with just these in our diethyl ether. And so now the idea is how to separate these two things, because we see that, well, this is a little bit more water soluble, but it's still not very water soluble. This is very not water soluble. So there are a few things that we can think of to try to use. We could maybe use a very strong base, which could deprotonate one of these alpha carbons on here and make it charged and do a separation that way. We could maybe think of doing a crystallization. So we would need to find an appropriate solvent for that. We could do multiple water rinses. Like I said, 3-hexanone is more water soluble than the cyclohexane, but you're going to end up getting a very dilute amount of your 3-hexanone doing that. You could maybe do a distillation, so the cyclohexane has a lower boiling point than the 3-hexanone. But the, the point is, there are multiple things you could consider trying to do if you wanted to try separating those things from each other. Uh, but anyway... That was what I wanted to talk about here with the liquid liquid extractions. And so I hope you found this video helpful and I will see you in the next one.